be very, very quiet. I'm hunting wabbits. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Dennis Gebhardt here with Guru Nation, and welcome to Rabbit Trails. For those of you that haven't joined us on Rabbit Trails before, let me tell you a little bit about our show. Our goal is to chase down the truth, the truth about how things work in our industry, understand a little bit more about hair color in general, to help you become more successful and help you navigate that pathway of success in your career. We do that by, number one, giving you non-branded, brand-neutral information. Uh, I invite guests on here who are experts in the field uh, and also associates of mine. And uh, today I'm happy to have Max Masano back with me. Again, um, Max is uh, out of Boston, Massachusetts. He has a salon there. He also works in Florida as well. So he, he travels up and down the East Coast of the United States. He is an educator. He has taught for L'Oreal. He's taught for Aveda. And he's also taught for Matrix. So he's had experience working for major manufacturers. And so we're not here to endorse any manufacturer today. We're here to simply give you uh, what the facts are about how different parts of the hair color business actually work. So Max, good morning, how you doing, buddy? Hey, good morning, Dennis, I'm doing great, how are you? Oh, good, it's great to see you. Uh, are you, uh, are you uh, having a good time um, over the holiday time here? Are I you... am, I am uh, currently freezing. We have about a foot of snow on the ground. Ouch, ouch. And uh, my, my Florida, blood has run thin mm. you know my wife is from chicago and um when we were dating um every time i would travel somewhere i'd always route myself through chicago and i am telling you some of the coldest days of my life were in chicago i remember the first time i went there to uh, spend the weekend and uh, my son was home here in california and so I got to O'Hare Airport and I called him. I said, I just wanted to let you know I've arrived safe. I'm all good. He goes, great, dad. He goes, how cold is it? I said, well, they say it's 52 degrees below zero. And he said, well, how cold is that exactly? I said, let me tell you something. Every joint in my body stopped functioning. Yeah. And of course, you know, Sylvia asked me, she said, well, do you have a winter coat if you're coming here in the winter? I said, oh, yeah, I got a winter coat. And I had a California leather long jacket, right? Well, you know, because you're, you know, Boston, uh, when you take a leather jacket and that's all you have on, plus a short sleeve shirt, because I'm from California, yeah. and you walk outside in 52 below zero weather, it's like you have 52 below zero weather on your body. That jacket does absolutely no good whatsoever. So <clears throat> I uh, decided that, uh, yeah, that I could never move back to that area. I like snow where I can drive to it, play in it, and then drive home. Exactly. Now, uh, my wife, when we got married, we moved. I moved her to California. And um, I, we have mountains right near us where we live here in California. And I said to her one time, I said, because we have Newfoundland dogs too, big dog. I said, let's go up to the mountains. She goes, no, 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 no. She said, I spent 30 years of my life in Chicago. <laughs> I came here. I'm not, why would I go back to snow? Because I know what that snow is like. <laughs> she goes, I don't need to go there. <laughs> she goes, I'm fine. Take a picture of it. Send it to me. I'll be okay. Right. So that's the way that is, you know, uh, People who don't live in it don't understand it. You know, I talked to someone from the East Coast just last week, and she said, well, she said, don't you like snow? I said, I love the first day of snow. There's nothing more beautiful than freshly fallen snow on the ground. It's day three I have an issue with. Because day three, the snow plows have come through, and they've plowed it all to the side. It's frozen again. Now you don't just have white snow, you've got gray snow, and it's not frozen completely. So underneath that layer of ice is water. So when you step down, <laughs> Flush. your whole shoe goes in the water. So see, because I know, because you know, I worked in New York for 16 years, so I know what that's like. 
right. there's nothing more frustrating than having a nice pair of shoes and stepping in that that garbage. But uh, it it is what it is, you know. Okay. It is what it is. So, all right. Well, look, we are ready to go on our our little bit of our uh, journey here today. So, I think the subject that we're going to talk about, I think, it's an important subject. And the reason is because, you know, if you think about the artists of the 20th century, let's say Picasso, Van Gogh, you know, any of those artists, Renoir, any of those artists, one of the things they knew besides being creative is they knew how to understand and how to prepare their canvas. So if they were painting on canvas itself, there was a certain process of preparation. And if you've taken art class in art school, they taught you how to prepare your canvas before you painted it. If they were painting on metal, there was a different form of preparation. If they were painting on stone, a different form of preparation. So <clears throat> I think preparing your canvas can be one of the essential parts of creating success. And one of the things that I know about preparation in our business is that it's not a, something we spend a lot of time talking about. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I tell the story of a painter who came to paint my house several years ago and he came out to give me an estimate. And he said to me, so, well, look, if I'm painting your house, uh, first thing I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to fill the cracks in your stucco because, you know, we were in California, so we were near fault lines and stucco. It's like sprayed cement. That's what it is. I live in a cement house. <laughs> stucco will have a tendency to crack as the ground shifts. So he said, I have to go through and fill all those cracks because I would not want to paint your walls of your house until those cracks were filled to make it look nice. And he said, um, I also need to sand down or um, base coat the eaves underneath my roof because we live in, we're, we're not far from Palm Springs. So the heat would cause the paint to lift off the surface. And so he said we had to sand it down, put a base coat on it, and then we could paint over it so that it would, you know, hold the color. And he said, I would never paint your house without power washing at first because we live in what is called uh, a wind tunnel uh, where we where we live here uh, we're in the northeastern corner of orange county and <clears throat> so winds come we have santa ana winds that will be 60 70 miles an hour so they blow dirt and crud and garbage and everything and you know that sticks to the walls of the house so he would power wash it and I'm standing there, I'm looking at him, I, and I know I have this dumbfounded look on my face. And he goes, what's wrong with you? I said, dude, you're talking about hair. And he looked at me like, what? <laughs> because think about how many times people color hair without any consideration of preparing it. In many salons today, the client as they come in the salon and they get ready for their color, the salon professional simply puts them in the chair, wraps them up and slaps the color on whatever they brought in. If their hair had variation in porosity, if their hair was not clean, uh, a multitude of things, you know, people who are product users, you know, their bathrooms look like our back bar. Right. And, we don't go to that step to prepare the hair because of, I don't have time. But then do you have time to redo it when you find that the color didn't take? So, and let's not forget redo is also a four letter word. Hey, it certainly is. Yeah. And that's free time. You don't get paid for that. Yeah. <laughs> so, Let's talk a little bit about preparation of the canvas, Max. What do you think? So, yes, you know, like I, I think traditionally in the past, most manufacturers would always say, you know, to apply any kind of hair coloring product onto clean, dry hair. Right. However, you know, in this day and age, especially, you know, people, number one, 
are not necessarily shampooing as often as they once were. And also, you know, those root touch-up sprays are really prevalent now. And let's not forget dry shampoo. And, you know, I don't know about you, but oh. some of my clients, like, they can, really milk that dry shampoo train. Can can we talk about dry shampoo yeah, in a please. little bit? Let's yeah. put that on the list to talk about as we go through those because that, that could be I a think people, area. they have no idea what a dry shampoo is made up of. Sure. Okay. So, you know, what, what would be considered clean dry hair, you know, is, is kind of in the eye of the beholder. And... And also, I think one of the things we need to look at is that, you know, manufacturers' instructions haven't changed in the past 30 years, too. So there are some, there are definitely some um, things that don't necessarily connect like they did or they once did. Mm -hmm. Like what things, what things can you think of? Well, again, with like that, the advent of product. Yes. Um, you know, and, and just like now. There's all different kinds of waxes and clays, you know, in the last five to 10 years, things yes. that, that really, you know, build up on the hair. Absolutely. And, you know, like just for personally speaking, living in Florida, like our water was treated mm -hmm. like to the point where you could smell on the days that they treated the water. Cause I would like turn my shower on and I would smell bleach. So the hair is also, you know, picking up, you know, random right. impurities, metals. There's also medications now, like we're, we're definitely a more medicated society. Mm -hmm. So you have all these, these factors that definitely could interfere with the coloring process. Right. Right. Um, I think, a lot of times it's understanding um, understanding what what clarification is. Yeah. Um, again, old school belief uh, for a lot of people is clarification is using something harsh on the hair to swell the hair, to pull the impurities out of the hair. And the reality is, is that really clarification or chelation is based upon positive, negative charges. So if I have hair that is full of uh, foreign material, foreign matter, uh, picks up stuff in the air, picks up mineral deposits from the shower, as you were saying, Matt, that hair is in a negative state. So when I use a chelating product, that is based on a positive negative charge. And they can do that at a low pH. Mm -hmm. They can do that at a pH of three, five to four, five. Sure. sure. Okay. What happens is that the surfactants in that product on uh, there, they have two sides, two ends, they have a tail and a head. And so the head side of the surfactant molecule is positively charged. So it attaches to those negatively charged impurities in the hair. The tail side of the surfactant is what we call hydrophobic. Hydrophobic means it doesn't like water. Hydrophilic means it does like water. So what happens is once that surfactant molecule has attached to that impurity, and then I apply water to the head, what happens is those impurities are pulled out of the hair fiber. So it's a positive negative charge activity. It's not a swelling of the cuticle activity. And I think those are things that are important for people to understand. And you were talking about waxes and coatings. Well, let's talk about coconut oil. Uh. <laughs> coconut oil, I cannot believe. I mean, look, applying coconut oil to your skin, I'm okay with that. It's small enough molecularly, it will penetrate into the skin. But coconut oil is a very interesting oil because it melts at a low at a low heat temperature, but it also becomes a solid once it cools. So you have people who are using coconut oil on their hair because someone told them that it helped to add shine and flexibility to the hair, and it is literally building up 
on the hair, layer on layer on layer. I call it uh, rain -X. Remember that stuff, rain -X you put on your uh, uh, windshield? That yes. Makes, that repels moisture? Yes. Well, well, coconut oil is doing the exact same thing. You're, you're basically putting a, a water, like a hydrophobic layer on the hair. Right. So then, so, so what typically tends to happen is you can't get moisture into the hair. So then you think you need to apply more. Right. So then you build up another layer, you know, and it's kind of like with any of those like sort of old school over the counter products that contained lanolin. Yes. And if you got, and for those of you out there who don't know what lanolin is, just Google it. But that was, uh, it was also uh, in hand lotion. Vitalis had lanolin in it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you're old enough, well, you'd have to have a grandfather that would remember Vitalis. <laughs> so, you know, it's like, I, I mean, I, we, we're in a new era of products and a new era of product use. And even just, you know, to me, dry shampoo is the equivalent of you know, uh, butane propelled baby powder on the hair. If you think color is going to cut through seven days worth of that, you know, it might, but you may just want to prep your canvas with a pH balanced clarifier. Right. It's a little and, bit of an insurance policy, really. And you need to check the ingredient deck because in some of those dry shampoos, they're using soluble metals. So the I soluble. Didn't know that. Oh yes. So the soluble metals help to create that attraction. Mm. Okay. So that the dry shampoo, you know, attaches it itself. Okay? Right. And then what happens is if you try to do a color over that, you could have a chemical reaction. Wow. So those things are very, very important. That's why all dry shampoos are not the same. I, I mean, I have to tell you that. Yeah. Which one are best? I, I, I can't tell you that. I can just tell you, you have to be, you have to use your due diligence. You have to check the ingredient deck to make sure that you're using the right products and don't necessarily believe the salesman. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, I've always said we use products for a whole different, we have a different criteria for choosing a product than whether or not it actually performs. It's like, does it smell good? Is it a cool looking can? <laughs> we, you see the criteria we're using to judge oh, yeah. it, but not on whether or not it actually performs well. And the thing about dry shampoos, if I'm going to use a dry shampoo, if that's part of my behavior, my styling behavior, then I'm going to make sure that I'm able to remove it with a simple shampoo. Yeah. Because if I'm not able to remove it with a simple shampoo, then I have a problem. You know, so, um, yeah, preparation is so important. Preparation helps avoid, well, avoid buildup of, or avoid the color not taking well. I mean, especially on your older clients, the clients with gray hair. You know, the thing is, is that, you know, when we get older, we lose elasticity in our skin. We, use co we lose color in our hair. We lose color in our skin. Just telling you young ones what you can expect. And so we use our melon extract, you know, to kind of tighten and firm everything up. Mm -hmm. And it has humectants and emollients in it. And is it possible, like, if I have my glasses off, everything goes together, you know? <laughs> so is it possible I can shove some of it into my hairline? Yes. And then I go in to get my color done, and I wonder why it didn't take successfully around my hairline. So, so clarifying and prepping the hair is very important. Also, I've always asked this question, Max. Who's the person who came up with the rule that when you're doing hair color, you always color the hair before you cut it? Who came up with that rule? I actually don't know. <laughs> so, so let me give you my spin. Yeah, do it. I shampoo and clarify the hair before I color it. Here's why. One, I can clarify it. Two, I can restructure it if it needs a protein treatment. Three, I can cut it so I'm not coloring hair that I end up leaving on the floor anyway. 
And four, if it's color placement, God knows I want to have the shape in before I put the placement in because the point of color placement or of color is to tell the story of the shape. And I don't know where they got to that rule. I think it comes from the old days when they said, well, you know, you want to make sure your hair's dirty when you color it so it protects your scalp. That's over. That's that doesn't happen anymore. Even with box color, I'm sorry. I know I'm offending people, but even with box color is not going to damage your hair. (laughs) So, so the thing to remember is that, We want to work on a clean canvas. Look, if you clarify the hair, here's the thing I promise you, it'll look a half a level to a level lighter than it did when she sat down in your chair. Oh, yeah. And and too, like, just to your point, I think that, you know, back in the day, let's say 30 years ago, when we were using a lot of really high ammonia bearing liquid colors, you know, you really, you know, you really did want a little bit of a layer of protection on the scalp right now, you know, with advances in technology, you know, it's completely a a different ball game. Yeah. And especially if you're using uh, non-ammoniated hair colors. Oh yeah. If you're using hair colors that don't see, here's the thing about ammonia. Ammonia is a volatile, right? Yeah. So ammonia will start to kick, kicks things off well with a non-ammoniated hair color you don't have a volatile you just simply have a fixed alkali exactly it's going to work differently i I actually have a great story to your point on that um so i worked for a manufacturer who released a non-ammoniated permanent hair color Mm -hmm. and when we were testing it in the test salon in new york we had this girl come in who had relaxed hair. She hadn't shampooed it in about a week. Um, you know, she was probably like a natural level three, four, mm-hmm. we were going to lift her, make her like a six bright red. And, you know, at, at the time, like we were, you know, there was like four of us kind of collaborating over this. And I said, do you think we should just, you know, clarify her first or at least pre shampoo? I was like, cause you know, it feels a little right. oily, there's product in it, et cetera. And they were like, no, 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 it'll be fine. So we, we applied, we did this virgin application and literally we went to rinse it. It didn't even look like we had colored the hair. Yep. It, it maybe shifted slightly, mm-hmm. but, but it was just like, couldn't get through. And after that point, we had to put in the uh, in the technical write up for the instructions for that particular product line that if there was any kind of styling product build up on the hair <laughs> to clarify and towel dry and then apply to you know damp wow. and and that's like a whole nother thing what's the what is damp right you know, as opposed to where does wet. that register on the meter right where's the damp where's the wet <laughs> right. okay um i usually when i'm helping people I, and giving them an idea about uh how what damp is is i always say once you have the hair shampooed and you've done all that and once you have it if you change the way you do your scheduling and if you did clarification, treatments, and haircut first, the hair would already be damp by the time you get to the color part. Yeah. Okay. If you don't want to do that, then I would say once you shampooed them, then you don't want to cut their hair. You want to wait and cut it later, whatever. You breeze the breeze dry the hair. I, I find that damp hair, what I call damp hair, is about 60 to 80% dry. And that then that's when I have damp hair. Um, it, it, and that that's what would qualify as that. If I have hair that's too wet, it's going to dilute my color deposit. That's what water will do. Right. Um, you know, social media, you know, everybody's trying to do something different than the other guy. And um, I saw a demonstration where they were taking their color and instead of adding clear to dilute the deposit, they added water which I find interesting 
because <laughs> it dilutes everything. It dilutes the color. It dilutes the peroxide. <laughs> yeah. It does everything. But um, uh, that that kind of situation, I think, is is really important for people to always remember is that if you change your behavior, and it really is the same window of time, it's just you're changing how you do things and you're changing how you book. You know, exactly. those are the things I think that are important. And it's going to give you a better result in hair. And, you know, some of these home remedies, you know, that's what happens in our industry is that we get these home recipes, right? Like baking soda and shampoo. Okay, listen to me. Baking soda has a pH of 9.3. Mm-hmm. Why, in the name of heaven, would you use that to clarify the hair? Okay, that's, that's crazy. Use it to remove the corrosion around the battery cables in your car. <coughs> Anybody who has ever done that, because that's a, that's, a, that's a thing, Right. <laughs> Here's that you put the baking soda on that that acid that is built up around the battery cables and you get this foaming action like you can't believe. <clears throat> I just think that that's crazy to to do that. You know, remember that chelation, proper chelation is a positive negative charge. And you know you were talking about build up max. There is a certain hair care company that touts themselves on being silicone free because silicones have a tendency to build up on the hair, which is not true. Uh, Some silicones do, most silicones do not. Most of the silicones that we're using today in hair care products don't really build up on the hair. So they don't use the silicone. However, they're using a polymer as their, as their um, what we would call a film former to help compact the cuticle. That's why they add those products into their, and they add those ingredients into their products is to give the hair more shine, to make the cuticle lay down. But the ingredient they're using is the same ingredient they use in artificial nails. And so, and so, they have a, <coughs> a no shampoo shampoo that has this ingredient in, in it. And I had the same experience that you had with a client who I love it because she's, she's in college. And of course, you know, I've done her since she was six. So she really considers me old, you know, and she considers me like, well, he's old. He doesn't know. I'm now a college student. I've done my research on Google, which is the bathroom wall, for God's sakes. Right. <laughs> okay. Or YouTube. And, don't or, don't or forget YouTube. The, the YouTube yeah. influencers. You yeah. Know. And so she started using that product without telling me. And her color was getting worse and worse. I said, hey, what in the heck have you been doing? And she says, well, I've been using this product. I said, why? And she says, well, because of all these great things about it. I said, really? I said, let me look at the ingredient deck. And I looked at it and I saw an ingredient. And I went, mm, I'm not sure about this. And I researched it and I said, do you know what this is? This is kind of like plastic. I mean, that's simply what it was. Okay. And it built up, coated her hair. Her hair would not even take, color, even with 20 volume, could not get her hair to lighten. So we clarified her. She did, we did like four clarifying treatments to pull that stuff off the outside of her hair strand. And then suddenly her hair would take color again. Yeah. You know, so. And, you know, like, I think it, it it's going to be different on a case by case basis. Right. And I'm not sure like for you, but for me on my back bar in the salon, I have a pH balanced or like a pH range between like 3.5 and 4.5 shampoo Mm -hmm. on Mm -hmm. my back bar. Yeah. But sometimes I'll go and I'll do that first shampoo. And if Mm -hmm. it doesn't break through or it doesn't foam up. Right. My next line of defense is actually just to go to uh, a, a clarifying treatment. 
right. that you can do right at the bowl. So it's right. still not like the, the 45 minute under heat, right. but, but then, but this is like, it's got a little bit of a higher pH, but it's kind of designed to break through a little heavier buildup. Yeah. And then, you know, I kind of build off that, you know, and then if I have to put them under like uh, with, with something a little more heavy duty, I will, because the hair will tell you the story, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> I don't really find, a, a, well, I find a need for sometimes for something a little bit higher, but not any higher than a pH of seven. Right. If I'm trying to clarify someone, yeah. definitely not in the nines. That's the same. That's where permanent waves live. And well, so, yeah, there, there is a company out there that actually has, has the pH right on the bottle. And I'm yeah. like, that's yeah. the same pH as permanent hair color. Yeah, absolutely. So I Why think that, that, yeah, I think in your toolbox, you need to have a selection of things that will help you work on this. Always keeping in mind that the, the job at the end of the day, the job is you got to keep the hair on the head. Exactly. Okay. So, you know, there's that, and that is the goal. So whatever kind of a color service I'm going into my main thought process, how can I achieve the result? and keep her hair on her head. And how can I duplicate it? I'm thinking ahead for the next time on what I'm going to have to do should she change her mind or whatever. And that's why, you know, and this is for another session is where I always help plant the seeds for her next visit. Yeah. So that way then she's not going, <laughs> you know, she's not going uh, off the highway somewhere and coming in and telling me she wants to be this color. Uh, I always try to keep them, you know, in line, plan ahead because at the end of the day, it's my work. That's the advertisement. Right. So if my work achieved her goal, but the sacrifice was the quality of her hair, then my advertisement is really poor. I always like to say, you know, I can, I can probably give you any color you want, but what I can, uh, you know, control is whether or not your hair feels like hay at the end of it. Right. And do you want, do you want this color or do you want Brillo? Right. You know, and I mean, and I hate to put it so bluntly, but it is one it of the only ways to, to communicate yeah. it. And see, prepping hair is more than just clarifying too. Prepping hair is, rebuilding, restructuring the hair Absolutely. before you do a color service. Because the reason that color goes or goes darker than expected, most often porosity has an issue to do with that. The reason that the color will pull an off tone, most often the hair's porosity or the hair's integrity will have something to do with that. So you're ensuring that you'll have success at the end of the appointment. Um, and even for clients who come in for balayage and for foil, I always, even though I've done the highlights before, I always take my acidifying spray and I have a treatment spray that I use as well, which has a very low pH, but it helps to put ionic bonds in that hair. And I spray it into that hair and just comb it through with a paddle brush. So the hair's not, not wet, but I comb it through with a paddle brush. Now, why am I doing that if I'm going to use a lightener on it? Here's why. Is that I would rather the lightener attack the ionic bonds than having it attack the remaining disulfide bonds sure. that are in that hair. So by filling the hair up with some more ionic bonds, it's going to allow me to do the application should I accidentally overlap. And it's going to prevent the hair from having any more damage than it already has. Um, I think you and I talked about this before, is that as you lighten hair, you know, here's the thing about that yellow that you see at the end. Mm -hmm. Yellow is a sign of life. And so once that yellow is gone, okay, once that yellow is gone, that means there's really not much protein structure left in that hair fiber. So I always... Yeah. 
want to fortify the hair. So that's all part of preparation as well. So when we say prepping the hair, I don't think we're always just talking about clarifying. We're talking about clarifying, fortifying, rebuilding that hair so that you'll get a great result. Yeah, 100%. So yeah. We, we like to call them support products. They all are designed to support your hair color service right. from start to finish. Right. You know? So, and, well, and there's a myriad of products available out there that are really great. Yeah. And well, they, they simply make your job easier. Well, see, I tell people I don't retail in my salon. I sell, I have support products. Yeah. So support products is part of your service. You have to use these to maintain your hair while you're away. In fact, that's part of my consultation with any new client. I say there will be specific products you'll be required to use to maintain your hair while you're away. I'm going to use those products on you today during your visit. And I'll have your at home regimen waiting for you at the desk so that you can take it home with you and keep your hair looking as beautiful as it will at the end of your service today. Yeah. It's not retail. It's part of the service today. It's really but, just like prescribing, like you're right. a doctor, right? Like, yeah, here's, here's what I recommend at the end of the yeah. day. It's up to you to fill the prescription, but if you want the best possible results, this is what's going to help support exactly. and maintain. Exactly. All right. Well, uh, I think we've covered uh, preparation pretty well today. Do you think? Uh, absolutely. I think this has been a great, good, good, good chat. Great. Dennis. Good, good chat. chat. All right. Well, listen, uh, those of you who are watching us here on YouTube, uh, hopefully you've enjoyed it today. I invite you to subscribe. You can do that right here at the bottom of the screen. Uh, you can also follow Max and I on Instagram. Max is at Max M Hair. Uh, you can find me at Real Captain Color. I also invite you to uh, go to our website, take check out what we offer as education. You can find us at www.gurunation.net. Uh, we have web webinars you can download and view. We have online virtual classes. We also have live classes that we do. Uh, throughout the year. Uh, also go to our gallery if you're interested to see what it's like to have, be in a class with us. We've got some videos there that talk about some of the classes. We have some photographs uh, of different classes that we've done. Uh, most importantly, it's to help you become more successful uh, than you already are in this business. So uh, I am excited to uh, move into this this uh this has been a great episode we've got other episodes upcoming so be sure that uh you stay tuned and hopefully you found this beneficial again if you have please send your friends our way and max i want to thank you again for being part of the program and uh wish you a uh, great day you have a great day and um as always from my heart to yours i am captain color i'm out of here stay tuned we have a quick commercial before we close off this program. So until we see you again, thank you all. Max, see you soon, friend. Thanks, Dennis. Thanks, Bye -bye. guys. Bye.